All right, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your participation in our first uh, of two career uh, fair uh, breakout panels. Uh, my name is Paul Sherman. I am the Director of Programs for CIDW. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful uh, panelists for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you speaking with us and providing your thoughts on this very important timely topic. Uh, I'd also like to thank, I don't believe she's on the call right now, but uh, our former YPN co-chair, Jamila White, who helped set, bring, uh, bring this idea to us and set this all up. So we really do appreciate her support as well, as always. I just wanna mention three different points before we actually dive into the content of this panel. The first is the exhibit hall will be reopening at 1.30. Next, our second panel will start at 3.45 and a networking happy hour with a raffle will sh follow shortly thereafter. Uh, please note all of those times are in Eastern Standard Time. And with that, I don't wanna take up too much more time. So I hope you stick around for the entire program. But with that, I wanna hand it, the floor over to our moderator for today's session, Amber Whittington, uh, who is the de uh, development specialist for the Center for Professional and Leadership Development at USA. So take it away, Amber. Thank you so much, Paul. Good morning, good afternoon. I shouldn't say good morning. Good afternoon and good evening to our participants that may be um, watching us from the Western Hemisphere and also our participants that may be joining us um, from other parts of the world. Uh, my name is Amber Whittington and as Paul said, I am a professional development specialist in the Center for Professional Development at USAID. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you today. And um, all of the panelists are from the International Career Advanced program and we want to just begin the session by giving a little bit of more of information about ICAP is the acronym and so ICAP I'm so sorry, I've been talking, you all can't hear me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. But um, I'm just gonna open up today by giving a little bit more context into ICAP. All of our panelists are from ICAP. And ICAP is a professional and leadership intensive program uh, for mid-career professionals from diverse communities. And so ICAP is sponsored by the University of Denver and it is hosted by the Aspen Institute in Aspen, Colorado. Um, several of the alumni from ICAP are ambassadors, um, USAID mission directors, many of them are now appointees. Um, and we're so just thrilled to have our, our, an illustrious panel from the ICAP Alumni Association. Um, we also want to use this opportunity to pay tribute and honor the life and legacy of one of our ICAP co-founders, and that is Mrs. Amita Samuels. Um, Amita was a generous soul, a lovely human being, and she invested time tirelessly into the lives of others. And so just to honor Amita and her contribution to the ICAP network, I wanted to take a moment of silence just to reflect on her and just to think about her and honor her legacy. So please join me for a moment of stillness and silence. Thank you so much. Today, we are uh, fortunate to have three, as I said, ICAP fellows who are foreign policy experts and who are going to be joining or uh, speaking on our panel today. And so I want to start by introducing Christina Hardaway, who is the Deputy Economic Chief um, for the U.S. Mission to Yande. Cameroon. I want to make sure I said Yande correct. Yande Cameroon. Next, we have Morgan Limo, who is a USAID Foreign Service officer serving in Kampala, Uganda. And next, we have Stephen Chu, who is the Director of Global Transparent Treasury, pardon me, with World Vision. And so we're going to start by asking Christina our first question. And so, Christina, you're joining us from Cameroon, where you serve as a Deputy Economic Political Chief at the Embassy. Can you speak on your journey in the Foreign Service? Could you also share insights and resources, particularly speaking about fellowships and the networks that you access throughout your journey? And Christina, we can't hear you. <laughs> having all the same problems today, I jinxed everybody. <laughs> And I should be used to this now after a whole year of doing Zoom meetings. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Amber. Um, good afternoon to everyone, good evening. Um, if you're in a different time zone, um, thank you for having me. 
Yeah, so I thought um, it was important to highlight about my journey that um, before I took the Foreign Service Officer Test, I did not know a lot about the Foreign Service or State Department or anything else. Um, I, I studied economics in undergraduate. Um, I was graduating during the financial crisis and originally I wanted to work in a bank. Um, I'm from Atlanta, so I want to stay in Georgia and that wasn't working out uh, <laughs> during that time. So. I want to make my first point about being curious and being flexible and just kind of looking for things where you, you don't think you would usually find them. So I went to a federal career panel at my school. State Department has what are called diplomats in residence and they sit at different um, schools across the country. So in Atlanta, uh, the diplomat in residence sits at Spelman. I went to Emory, so he did a, a, a presentation over at my school. And now that things are, are virtual, you can you know, attend virtual events. So that's the first thing is to um, reach out to a diplomat in residence if you're interested in a State Department career, not just foreign service. Um, and then he just told me about his journey. He was an African-American man from this rural uh, town in Georgia. I remember that. And I was like, wow, how did he do all this? And he encouraged me to take the test and to apply um, for State Department fellowships. And I'll, I'll mention those fellowships. Um, but before that, I had no clue what the Foreign Service was, like what they do. Um, I had studied abroad, but that was like my first real taste of kind of overseas and what uh, international life would be like. But, but yeah, but before that, no, no really planning or thought to it. So he encouraged me to apply for the Charles B. Rangel Fellowship and the Thomas Pickering Fellowship. So those are, are State Department fellowships. They're, they're similar in structure, um, they pay for a graduate degree in, in a subject related to international relations. So I did my graduate degree in public administration and international relations. I did a dual degree at, at Syracuse. Um, you do an internship overseas. You do an internship domestically, either at State Department or, or in Congress. Um, and then you enter into the Foreign Service um, provided that you, you pass all the clearances as, as well. So that was my journey um, through the, the, the fellowships. Um, with this question, I thought I would highlight a lot of other fellowships because those are just State Department fellowships, but there's a lot of other things out there that might um, serve as a good bridge or introduction to an international career. Um, similar to State Department, USAID also has a fellowship called the Payne Fellowship, which is it's the same structure as well. Um, it pays for school and then you enter into the USAID Foreign Service um, you can also think about language. So there's the Boren Fellowship, there's the Criti Critical Language um, Scholar Fellowship. Uh, and then State Department has another, another, a, a number of other uh, fellowships um, towards specialist tracks. So I also wanna mention the Foreign Affairs IT Fellowship that State Department um, sponsors. All of these things, most of the State Department things can be found on careers.state.gov. Um, with that being said, um, I want to highlight that I'm a foreign service generalist, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm expected to pick up kind of any <laughs> subject that's thrown at me within a, a short amount of time, but there are also specialist tracks. And with the specialist tracks is, is where we're really in demand right now, um, if you're thinking about a State Department career, particularly overseas. Um, we need IT specialists, we need medical professionals, we need admin assistance, we need those types of things. So I also want to encourage you to follow um, the Department of State Careers social media. They post all these um, opportunities and to visit the careers.state.gov to get a full scope of all the different opportunities there are at State Department because there are quite a, quite a few. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Christina, that, that thorough um, readout of all the, the, the plethora of opportunities. So Stephen, we're coming to you next. So we can go ahead and get your mute. <laughs> there we go. So Stephen, can you speak about transitioning from the private sector into development? What are the global trends and the best practices that you observed um, in making this transition? Sure, um, thank you um, for inviting me. And I, I do wanna, you know, the, I think your question is really broad, so it's hard to kind of answer it very um, effectively, but I'll just take it from my own personal experience. Um, 
my background, I studied sociology in college. Um, when I was there in college, the professor said, um, you can either take two routes, you can be a management consultant or you'll be a social worker. And I was like, I wanted to kind of do both at the same time. So I ended up doing management consulting for uh, four years, first in New York City and then in Washington, DC. Um, the partner there said, if you want to be a partner with me at Price Waterhouse, um, you need to follow my footsteps and go to Wharton and do all these kind of jump through all these hoops. And I said, well, you know, that's interesting and all, but I'm really interested more in some sort of nonprofit social good related career. I ended up going to Berkeley for grad school and assumed that I could make that transition easily um, into the nonprofit, either domestic or international development space, at least coming from a, a US based university. And I had a really hard time doing that. So I went to, I would, did Harvard for undergrad, went through the Harvard online directory. I found very few people there um, who self identified as, oh, I work at Mercy Corps, I work at Save the Children or whatnot. Um, I went to Berkeley for grad school. I did the same thing and, and I had a really hard time trying to use my alma maters. I had a hard time trying to use my PwC and all my consulting connections to be able to do a parlay or transition over to the global development sector. And so I struggled through that, honestly, and I applied for probably a couple years. I, I took the job, basically, I, I moved from Berkeley back to Washington, DC, knowing that DC was the hub of all these different development agencies. And I, I struggled, I tried to have a lot of different conversations and it didn't really work out quite frankly um, I'll say though that there's a lot of work that had to be done in terms of info interviews uh, quite frankly and I'll share this a little bit later but ICAP really did help uh, I met my now wife um, who used to work under Tom Rowe who um, helped found ICAP uh, but she also actually helped connect me with a number of different people including uh, Rory Anderson who now works at the State Department and she was the one who actually did my first info interview where I was able to get my tr transition over the private sector into um, um, a development agency and it was because of her and a number of other people who, be, who were actually positioned within the development sector that helped me build fluency in the, in the terms, um, understand all the different issues, but also recognize that I had weaknesses because I had a, a private sector lens that biased me and sometimes was not necessarily as acceptable within the development space because they're like, oh, you're kind of typecast as a development, uh, kind of a, an ex-management consultant. So ICAP really helped transition me a bit, both in fluency and in networking and um, info interviews and finding the right people to uh, build my career. So Amber, you want to um, turn your mic on? Thank you so much for that. I know. So not, you know, just to kind of um, for people who may be coming from different sectors in government. So I came from the Hill and wanted to, to transition into development. And something that was so um, helpful for me was listening to, to, to think tanks, you know, watching like I literally had to go to CSIS, Brookings, um, just to get the lingo, like she said, just to get the vocabulary and to get like, what are the wicked problems? That's one of the things that we talk about. What are the wicked problems? And so definitely availing yourself to those resources as well, in addition to ICAP, in addition to to, to the um, other networking. And so Morgan, we're coming to you so you can get your mic ready. Wonderful. And so Morgan, can you, so Christina talked about entry into um, the State Department Foreign Service, her journey. Can you talk about your journey into the Foreign Service and also um, USAID is a hiring and can you kind of talk about what that process looks like? Sure. So I was probably the opposite of Christina in that I <laughs> was foreign affairs sort of all day um, and when I went to graduate school, I did uh, graduate school at the University of Illinois, as well as at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. And so I was really interested in going into the State Department Foreign Service. And I was not aware of the USAID Foreign Service or the Foreign Agricultural Service or the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, um, Department of Commerce Foreign Commercial Service, um, or even the US Agency for Global Media. So there's a lot of other foreign affairs agencies uh, in the US government. And so I would encourage everyone who is interested in the foreign service to look at those as well, because while there are some really rewarding careers in the State Department, there's also really rewarding careers uh, at other departments and agencies. So USAID, we are unique in that we have a more technically focused foreign service. Uh, Christina mentioned that she was a generalist. Um, and so they have sort of broad stroke positions like political or economic or consular management. Ours are much more technical. So we have population health and nutrition officers, crisis stabilization and governance, environment, agriculture, education, 
We also have some support uh, backstops as we call them, they call them cones at state. Um, but basically program officers, which I am, we have executive officers, we have uh, acquisition assistance officers who do contracts as well as financial management officers who do finance. So we sort of have lots of different specialties and, and that's something that I would say is pretty unique um, about the Foreign Service. I think my pathway was unique in that I was actually an intern at USAID. So when I was in grad school, I did an internship at the State Department. Um, and then I came over to USAID as an intern working in legislative and public affairs. And so what you said, Amber, about speaking different languages um, really resonated with me because I had also worked on the Hill before coming into aid. And uh, I used to you know, make a joke about how CRS on the Hill is Congressional Research Service and in the aid world, it's Catholic Relief Services. Um, so really even just being able to know the acronyms and things like that, um, was really important to transition. So I joined the agency as an intern and I worked in a variety of different hiring mechanisms, contracts, interagency agreements that we'll talk about a little bit later um, before joining on into the Foreign Service. Thanks. Thank you for that, Morgan. Thank you for that. And uh, th the other thing that I want to kind of caveat that too is not even caveat, but um, with because of the fact that it's specialists at USA that often people are a little bit more senior in their careers, you know, they're, they're kind of coming in often at the mid levels because they, they have worked with implementing partners, they've worked with the NGOs that we are funding as an agency, and then they um, often will transition into a foreign service role. So um, that's another kind of important thing for younger professionals. Um, so yeah, so now we're going to be handing it over to Steven. So Steven, you're going to be up next. And the question you mentioned, ICAP and you mentioned that you found the love of your life at ICAP so it was, it was definitely had an impact on you but can you can you can you share about why you applied for ICAP um, how the program has impacted your life that's the question we I think we got a good um, yeah. a good summation of that but also can you talk about preparing an ICAP application a solid ICAP application as well with that thank you um, so I did a, a separate fellowship um, similar to ICAP, except it was called the Robert Twigo Foundation. Basically, it helps um, uh, MBAs get jobs at investment banking, investment management, private equity, hedge funds, whatnot. Um, and it was a way to help create diversity within the investment finance uh, world in, in Wall Street. I felt like that was interesting and valuable, but I had done a career change away from finance. I was trying to figure out my space. The reason I applied to ICAP was it wasn't necessarily like right when you are graduating, but it's it's you need a number of years of experience in the sector. And it for me, at least, I felt like there was a need for me to kind of reflect a couple years into my kind of development career post graduate school to reflect and kind of really think about what do I want to do versus what can I do and what should I do. Um, and, and to have that personal reflection and to, and to spend time with other folks, almost like you're back in college in the dorm environment, except in this pristine Aspen environment, reflecting. Um, I thought that was really important. The other reason I had heard um, was pretty much, I think most, I don't know how many uh, African American leaders at the State Department actually descend into Aspen during that week. And I just felt like there was so much wisdom and insight of how do you think through a 30 to 40 year career trajectory and start thinking about it, the pacing and milestones that you want to think about versus just talking to someone a couple years up. So my interest in ICAP was both the the value for reflection, the value for um, connecting with people who are much more senior, um, and to recognize all the diversity issues that are entangled within these different development agencies. Um, so there was that, and then also just the personal family. I mean, I know my wife, Melanie, she does keep in touch with a lot more people than I do personally. We're based out of, of Los Angeles, so it's quite far from Washington, DC, not as far as uh, Kampala or whatnot, but, um, I feel like there is a family within ICAP um, and that is really another reason why I think ICAP has been valuable um, to me and why I was interested. The application process, I, I don't think I could talk that much about it specifically. Um, I It was really more just, again, a reflection of who I am, what do I want? And that kind of helped prepare me for going into a week as a retreat with others who also have done some of that soul searching of what is their life about versus what is their kind of career about? Um, so I don't know if that helps. 
That is very helpful. That is very helpful. And so I can speak about some of the rigors of ICAP. So I had to apply for ICAP three times. I applied three times. And I say that because um, just to let people know that it is a competitive process, but do not be deterred. Do not be deterred. If you want to apply, many people actually have to apply multiple times because it is, it is um, a highly subscribed uh, fellowship. And um, what I would just encourage you is to really look at the mission and to think critically about how you can embody and live um, out that mission um, even prior to applying so that you can have a really good application. And so that's what I did. Mentorship is a huge component of ICAP. And so I took that to heart so that the third time that I applied, I had evidence that I could point to of how I have mentored um, the next generation of foreign policy practitioners. So this is something else to, to think about. Um, for our next question, we're going to be coming to uh, Christina. And so Christina, can you recommend other networks and associations for Black, Indigenous, and peoples of color groups um, in foreign affairs and in development? Yeah, um, so I, I made a list um, and the, the benefit of being in, Washington and DC, being in Washington, D.C. is that a lot of these groups are kind of centered there. Um, so some of the groups that I'm personally involved in, um, one is called Black Professionals International Affairs, um, they're made up of, of different um, foreign affairs professionals, not just from State Department, but from a, a, a wide uh, group of people. Um, there's the Women's Foreign Policy Network, uh, Women Advancing Peace and Security, uh, which the founder, Ambassador Jenkins, she's now um, back at State Department now in a senior position. Um, Black Women in International Affairs, uh, which is a social media account. I also want to recommend the Association of Professional Schools for International Affairs. So all these schools like um, Georgetown School of Foreign Service, SICE, um, like the, the, the heavy hitters for international affairs, they, they make up of an association, um, which is very known as State Department, it's where we do a lot of our recruiting. Um, but if you follow their social media and, and even their events, I think they offer very, very good advice for early career professionals who are looking to get into international development. Uh, and then some other social media accounts that are just fun. I like to follow them. Uh, one is Diplo Noir. So that's D-I-P-L-O-N-O-R-E. Um, my personal friend runs that account, but it highlights just stories of, of, of Black diplomats. Um, there's also Diplo uh, Latinx. So uh, Diplo uh, Latino with L-A-T-I-N-X at the end. Um, and then there's NatSec Girl Squad, which is also an organization, but if you look on um, social media, it's hashtag NatSec uh, Girl Squad. Um, so those are the, the main kind of foreign affairs organizations I would recommend for, for people of color. Um, I also wanna highlight some well-known State Department, what are called employee affinity groups. Um, which, are, like I said, now things are virtual. A lot of things um, can be viewed even if you aren't formally part of State Department. Um, so there's Thursday Luncheon Group, which is actually the oldest employee affinity group at State Department. Um, but they were started by a group of African-American Foreign Service officers. Um, welcome to, to anyone. Um, but that, that's one of the leading organizations at State Department who has been pushing for diversity um, efforts. So if you follow them on LinkedIn, um, social media, some of their events are, are, are public and I think um, it's a good, good networking group in general. And then something dear to me is called the Pickering Wrangell Fellowship Association. <laughs> so we have a Facebook group. Um, I think we're working on a LinkedIn group, but we definitely have a Facebook uh, page that you can follow. So that's what I recommend in terms of the sphere of groups that I know. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chris, Christina. And so um, we're about to get to our last moderated question. And so please, um, please put your questions into the chat box. Um, feel free to message me directly if you have a question um, so that we can make sure to ask our, our panelists. And so question, um, so Morgan, this question is for you. And um, I wanted to ask if you could speak about other methods to join um, the USAID workforce. So we know about the civil service, we know about the foreign service, but um, could you talk about other maybe contractor opportunities or fellowship opportunities uh, with the agency? Absolutely. So as you said, I think most people think that USA's workforce is predominantly made up of foreign service, foreign service limited, and civil service. Um, but actually, the majority of our workforce are foreign service nationals. 
Um, so foreign nationals of the countries that we work in. Um, however, there are a lot of other opportunities. We have over 20 different hiring mechanisms within USAID. It can actually get quite complicated um, to figure them all out. Um, so I'll just touch on some of the more popular ones. We have personal service contractors, um, which have a direct relationship with the agency. So there's a contract between AID and you. We have quite a lot of institutional contractors who work for a private company or implementing partner, probably many of the SID Washington organizations um, have some sort of institutional contract arrangements with us. Um, we also have a lot of folks who work with IPs and directly support our programs and activities. Um, so there are options there. And then we have many different sorts of interagency agreements. There's fellowships. I know Christina already mentioned uh, the Boren. Um, but we also have the Presidential Management Fellowship, which is applicable to the whole of the US government. Um, we accept fellows from Jefferson Fellows, AAAS Fellows. Um, sorry, AAAS is the Ad American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, we have born Fellows as well. We have Pathways Internships. And so there's really a wide variety of hiring mechanisms. And to Amber's point, a lot of the more direct hire positions tend to be at higher levels. Um, and so a lot of people do get their foot in the door through contract opportunities. And so they're not always going to be directly posted on the USA.gov website. Um, you should definitely check out DevEx and other resources. I'm sure Sid Washington also has some useful resources for folks. Um, so I would look all over for different postings because they're not necessarily going to be on the USAID website, um, but they're out there and uh, we look forward to working with you. Yeah, and uh, another place for those opportunities is um, another another mechanism, we call them hiring mechanisms, the, the alphabet soup, is uh, Foreign Service Limited opportunities. And so those are um, really technical experts who have years of technical experience, and they kind of come into a, um, a partnership contract agreement with the agency, and they spend about 50% of their time, they're based at headquarters, but spend 50% of their time in the field. Well, when we were going to the field, uh, going to, I should say our missions, uh, spending time in, in our missions and consulting. And so a way to identify those opportunities and also as well as personal services co contractor opportunities is um, FBO. F is in Frank, B is in business, um, O is in office. So, you know, FBO.gov, and that stands for Fed Biz Ops. And uh, you can identify those opportunities if you go to Fed Biz Ops and just look for contractor or, um, opportunities with a particular agency. So that's another another kind of um, another kind of tip, tip trick of the trade. Um, so one of the questions from our um, that is coming in through the chat are: Most global jobs require previous um, international experience, and so it's kind of one of these chicken and the egg scenarios where how can you gain experience if you don't have an opportunity that will give you a chance? And so is there anyone from our panel that would like to address identifying um, international um, opportunities when you have limited experience? I can answer that quickly. Um, I did a lot of volunteer short term projects when I was working prior to getting into international development. So I do a two or three month like I negotiate with my boss to do a two or three month in Uganda and in South Africa and all these different places. I hobbled all those together and said you know, like the job I think I applied to was like five or 10 years of international experience and I didn't have any where I was based permanently outside of the US but I basically argued I guess persuasively because I got the job that if I cobble all these different positions to get uh, roles that I did on a pro bono basis doing internal audit of a microfinance group over there doing a marketing plan with another group over here together the composite of it would meet that requirement of international experience for five or ten years and so that worked for me I don't know if that works for all different situations um, but yeah that that was one way I, I approached it I would also like to chime in just really quickly with a little known fact, um, particularly as the agencies look to increase diversity. Um, I know at least within USAID, a lot of our advertisements, though they note that you should have international experience, they also note some other domestic experiences that are, that are acceptable to be counted towards that international experience. So if you've done domestic work, or you've worked with underrepresented groups, uh, they have some specifics like if you worked on a Native American reservation, if you worked with communities of color, if you worked in diaspora communities, you are 
actually allowed to count that towards your international experience. And that is something that's little known, um, but I wanted to make sure to make that point here today, um, because as Stephen alluded to, even if you do have to cobble together different experiences, know that you know if you're working with Ethiopian communities in Washington, D.C., and you speak fluent Amharic or Tigray, um, you know, that experience is valuable and you are able to count that towards your international experience for USAID. Over. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll just, yeah, so I'll just reiterate what I said at the beginning is, is that, you know, for State Department, um, a lot of what we're looking for that, that we have a shortage of are people who have specialties such as tech and, and science. Um, so I'll repeat that, but I'll also say that as a generalist and I'm, I'm probably, um, not as in tune with the international development specialties. Um, you don't need to have an IR degree to be a foreign service officer generalist. Um, the key skills that we value are um, written and oral communication, particularly writing. Most of, most of our, the things that we do, um, I have to write a product for and I have to send it um, and you, you have to do it fast. So that's the key thing. Um, I do a lot of what would be considered client or contact management, um, making contacts here. That could be like a government relations job domestically. Um, and then just being adaptable and flexible because I mean, you know, yes, I, I have a focus on um, foreign affairs, but a lot of the issues that happen that, that come to us, it's like, we just have to figure it out. <laughs> and, and with that being said, um, we're looking for someone who's resilient, um, has an eye towards customer service or service in general um, and, and very adaptable. So that's my, that's my take on being a generalist. Okay. And so Christina, we're gonna ask the next question to you. So you talked about writing, you talked about being able to write and write quickly. What are some, some strategies, some tactics that people, and this is actually for the, this is a follow-up to Christina, but everyone please chime in. What are tactics and strategy on keeping your writing skills at a, at a very high level? So that it doesn't become a blocker, especially for people who maybe have um, where English is not their second, their their first language. It may be a second language. Yeah. yeah. Well, the first thing is that government writing is not academic writing, and with with interns in particular who are used to writing um, college papers, I gotta I gotta drill into them that you need to keep your sentences short. Um, this needs to be one. You need to sum this up in one page. I don't need a whole ten pages to explain anything. Because this is going to an ambassador who's reading dozens of papers um, every day. So um, succinct writing that captures what you're trying to say um, pretty quickly is one. Um, there are a few books that, that we read as, as, as generalists that we just kind of consider as writing Bibles. Um, one is The Elements of Style, Struke White. Um, I'll, look it up, I'll look up the exact name and write it in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we follow to a certain extent AP guidelines. So things like, and, and you, you get this, you know, as you, if you get an internship or a job, things like writing out numbers one through nine, writing out percent, US is an adjective, United States um, is a noun, like things like that. Uh, we get very particular about it, State Department, double spaces mm -hmm. after the periods, but, but all of that you learn. But the, the, the point though, um, is that you practice, um, once you get in, you, you read, um, you, you follow some examples. Um, but for us, we you, you keep it short um, to the point, very simple plain language. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Anyone else would like to speak to that? Okay, wonderful. So um, another question that has come in and we probably need Okay, a little bit more clarity around this, but we'll ask it. Um, how far in advance of graduating um, with a master's degree is a good time to start applying for some of the um, for some of the fellowships that you all mentioned and some of the opportunities that you you all mentioned? Like, do people need to start, um, you know, right? Do they actually kind of need to start even before they begin their master's? What I mean, obviously, the earlier the better. But is there any particular tricks of the trade that you all have um, have utilized or heard of? I applied my, my spring semester of my senior year of college. I don't know if that's a good example, but. <laughs> You're a unicorn. That's what you are, right? <laughs> I didn't know anything about the foreign service and I got it and I get these great pose. That's what you are, Christina. I, You're no, a genius. I don't know if that's a, oh, but no, but, when, but other than applying, one thing that helped me was that I shared my goals with my professors um, and I had a relationship with my professors who were able to write recommendation letter, letters for me quickly when I asked. So that's apart from the application, 
that is what I recommend is keeping uh, relationships with people who can uh, write you letters, um, give you career advice. Yeah, that that's brilliant. Someone even talked about identifying mentors. Your your professors, your professors can be some of your greatest mentors, and they can pass information on to you. So definitely keep in touch with professors and former employers. Anyone else about kind of the the process? I would just second that it usually has to be in your undergraduate because many of the fellowships are actually supporting you through graduate school and they provide incentives and opportunities to pay for graduate school. Um, so often by the time you're already well into graduate school, it's a little bit late to get into some of the fellowships. Um, so definitely if you're still an undergraduate, that's the best time to be looking out for them. Um, I have seen some people who've had master's degrees and pursued second master's degrees and other things through the program. So it's not a total lost cause, um, but definitely the earlier, the better. Over. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. Um, another, so Morgan, we're coming to you with this one. Another question is, um, the person is curious about making them transition at mid-level into professional development and strategies that they can implement to make that transition. Sure. So is this specific to foreign service or just in general? And the they said field? they said directly to USAID. So I, 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 and I, well, let me also say this. They said, I would love to spend a few years working under the agency. So I presume it's not a career. <laughs> It's not, it's not a career uh, commitment like a U.S., like a foreign service, but maybe maybe a civil service position, but yeah. But I think you already spoke to this and that mm -hmm. things like foreign service limited opportunities, mm -hmm. personal service contracts, they are perfect for someone who has a lot of experience, wants to contribute to the mission of the agency, but does not necessarily want to invest in a full career mm -hmm. um, as an FSO. So those would be what I suggest for someone at the mid-level um, we did used to do mid-level hiring for FSOs. I'm not sure where that stands at this point, mm -hmm. um, but there were some mid-level opportunities historically. Um, so if those come back around, I would also look out for those. But I would definitely say contract opportunities um, as well as shorter term uh, non-career opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, this is an interesting question. So um, has anyone heard of any um, different approaches to the international experience um, requirement now that COVID has, you know, completely um, impacted our ability to get that experience. So have you seen, so I know Morgan talked about the, um, the diverse, um, diverse work experience, that it can be domestic diverse work. Has anyone else heard about maybe a, a shift or a pivot in that requirement um, for international um, organizations? I haven't heard anything specifically about it. I do know that a lot of people in USAID are return Peace Corps volunteers mm -hmm. and they get their experience through the Peace Corps. And in a lot of countries, the volunteers were removed um, and that there was a lot of uncertainty about when they would go back. So I do think that there are some sort of uh, flexibilities that have been built in for folks who intended to complete their service but didn't fully complete it um, that I've seen the USG, sorry, the US government acronym super. Um, be willing to accept that you've completed your full two years of the Peace Corps, for example, even if you did maybe a year and a half, but it got cut short because of COVID. Over. Okay, thank you so much for that. And there was also a question regarding if there was a um, Peace Corps kind of pipeline, hiring pipeline for USAID. Um, I am not aware of it. I think that there are definitely a lot of Peace Corps, um, Peace Corps alumni within our agency, and it's kind of you know, one of those things that you get a lot of respect, you get a lot of street cred <laughs> within our agency if you have conducted a Peace Corps um, experience, but I don't know if there's a pipeline program for it. Well, you it. get the, the federal non-competitive or competitive yeah. status, yeah. Yeah, the federal non-competitive status, yeah. Okay. So, so I guess there is a kind of a pipeline, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So the non and you can find out more about the non-competitive status. Obviously, discussing it with the Peace Corps. Um, organization and then also looking on USA jobs for that as well. Um, this question is to Christina, I'm trying to find it. Um, and it's regarding internships. Can dual citizens um, conduct State Department internships? Generally, yes. Um, so you have to be able to get a, a TS clearance for State Department internships, um, which yes, you need to be a US citizen. Uh, it depends on what you're working on. So even for us FSOs, um, we do have dual citizens who are FSOs, but 
they might be precluded um, from working um, in, a, in a certain country on certain issues. So it just depends, but you, you, if you're a US citizen, um, you are generally eligible for top um, secret security clearance. Okay. Okay. And so that's another kind of question regarding the USAID Foreign Service or the Foreign Service in general. Um, are these opportunities eligible for non-US citizens? I would just chime in that many of them are not just because you have to be able to get a security clearance and you need to be an American citizen to obtain that. Um, but there are opportunities with a mechanism that we call TCNs, uh, third country nationals, where you may work in a mission, but you may be from another third country. So you're not a foreign service national from that nation, but you may be from elsewhere. Um, so we do have some opportunities for folks that are not US citizens, but that come from a third country um, or are from the host country that we're working with over. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll add that most most of the staff in the embassies are actually local um, mm -hmm. local local staff. They come from that country. So if you're overseas, yes, there 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 are job opportunities at, at U.S. embassies for um, people who are not American citizens. It's I mean it is harder if you're domestically in the states. Yeah, you need you need to be able to get a TS clearance, and the and the first thing for that is to be a U.S. citizen. Okay. Okay. Um, and this is a, a question that. Um, I think, yeah, so I, we'll, we'll ask it. Um, as foreign service officers, basically as diplomats, can you speak to cultural competency? Um, do you feel that your agencies have adequately equipped you with the resources and skills for uh, multi multicultural teamwork and to maintain resiliency while living abroad? <laughs> We're on the record now. <laughs> No, I mean, there's definitely opportunities. There's language training. Um, there's some specialization trainings that you can take. Um, but I, I'm not, we don't have a formalized sort of cultural competency. I think a lot of people have to just come in the door with that. Or if they don't come in the door with it, they develop it over time. Um, so I can't say that the departments or agencies are the ones equipping you, but I think they do a good job of recruiting people who sort of have that interest and want to hone those skills, even if they don't come in the door uh, having those skills. Yeah, I would I would echo what Morgan said. You know, it's there's no like specific class that we take to gain our cultural competency. I mean, I do. I we take uh, language. If you don't have the language, that comes with. I mean, every language comes with a cultural element to it. You're not just learning like grammar and sentences, you're learning the culture as well. Mm -hmm. So there's that, but um, there, I don't, I wouldn't say that there's like a comprehensive curriculum on multiculturalism. I will say that though, um, this is my first time being a manager um, and I, you do have to balance between um, adapting to the culture and getting your work done as part of the U.S. government. So I'm in I'm in West Africa. Things are very flowy here, less structured. And then there's State Department, <laughs> U.S. Embassy. It needs to be double spaces after the period. So <laughs> it is it's a it's a learning experience for me. But um, like Morgan said, they I I do have um, an awareness of that, and I'm not just like okay, you guys are just doing it all wrong. Um, I am adapting my leadership style um, to respect, I guess, the culture here, but also make sure that we can get our, our work done and be productive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Stephen, did you wanna, yeah. Yeah, I don't have a direct answer to that question. Um, I do like a good argument, so I'm gonna throw out something a little bit different. Um, I do think that, um, at least on the NGO development side, there is a bias toward, at least what I've seen, especially the larger ones, uh, toward technocratic or technical experts in their fields over cult cultural competency. So we or general different organizations may tend to hire people because of their expertise in finance or their expertise in agriculture. 
while we do infuse, and I've been in countless interviews where we have some sort of cultural competency question, that question is oftentimes deprioritized comparatively to their technical acumen in that field. Um, as a result, development agencies, I would argue, have a, a need to continue, I mean, as through all the diversity, equity, inclusion efforts happen and spin through corporate and through all the different sectors, within the global development space, I, I mean, I've seen it in ICAP even, there's a, a growing need to build a competency around how do you think about inclusion equity issues, mm -hmm. um, especially as the hiring really biases toward technical people who yeah. are able to make the organization run and spin more effectively without mm -hmm. thinking through the cultural competency, perhaps blind spots that might come with that. And mm -hmm. so I would just say, you know, I think there is a growing need for this and certain organizations are much farther ahead than others. Um, and if you're able to build that in and build that as an insight, it may be advantageous to you as you go through the recruitment process, at least on the NGO side. So. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Okay. And so Christine, and this is this is going back to Christina's question, but let's let's talk about it from a broader level so all of our panelists can kind of speak about it. You talked about leadership. You talked about growing as a leader and, and even kind of now being a supervisor. You know, congrats to you. You've you've made it. <laughs> you know, you have kind of the golden handcuffs, you know, of, of being a leader in the federal government and a and a and a manager. Can you talk about, can everyone talk about what are their leadership, um, what are their leadership, the, the leadership advice, wisdom, or practices that they have had to kind of pull on to help them um, continue to grow and ascend as as a as a professional. And so Morgan, let's have Morgan go, and then we can go to Steve, and then we can go to Christina. Sure, I'll I'll happy to start. I'll be very brief. I think just listening skills are really critical. Um, a lot of times, particularly when you have officers coming into a new post, they are sort of still learning the lay of the land, and but they may feel they have the knowledge. Um, they may come into a country feeling like they have the answers to the development problems that we're presented with. Um, and that's usually not the case. Um, we need to be able to listen to our FSN colleagues, listen to those who have way more expertise than we do. Um, and I think just taking that time to step back and hear, you know, this is a challenge that we face. Here's a way that we've done it before um, is really critical because a lot of folks see a lot of different officers come in. You know, mm -hmm. every couple of years, there's a new batch of people. Yeah. Um, and so they've seen it and they've heard it. And so it's really just, being humble and knowing that you still have a lot to learn, even as a as a manager, mm -hmm. um, and being willing to listen to the team and be aware. I mean, in in any government entity, knowing sort of what your resources are, um, both human and financial resources, and being able to mobilize them is really the most important uh, of our bureaucratic skills. And so, I would say that's listening, and then really just sort of knowing where the resources are and where you can pull in to. Uh, address and tackle any any challenges. What I would say are the two top things for me. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I was in DC for about 12, 14 years. And I remember I, one of the first guys I met was a translator. And I, I kind of laughed. I was like, what do you do? Your, your, your whole focus is just translating. And you just walk in. And I, it was very condescending. And I, I take that and I realized I was, I was so wrong. Because for me, at least, translation is kind of pivotal to be an effective leader, being able to understand where one person is speaking, not just like languages per se, but the language of a sector, the language of a function, the language of an organization, and being able to translate that between different groups allows you to better understand and listen, but also speak in the same language where people can hear that because you're translating the needs of one group as you're trying to negotiate with another. So. That I just say, you know, um, being able to listen is, is so key, is so key, but also being able to speak in that language. For me, you know, I remember when I first got started, like I was trying to be able to speak the language of, of economists. So I would read the economist from page one to the last page on a weekly basis to try to learn that language so I could speak that language to others. Um, at the same time, another thing that I've done over my career is, is try to position myself at key intersection points. So position points, like for instance, at least on the NGO world, program people and finance people, those are career pathways. But there are very few people who have done both sides on a regular basis, um, where they switch from program to finance, finance to program, or public financing to, um, so like, um, 
U.S. government grant um, acquisition versus private funding working with major donors and billionaires. Being able to position yourself at that intersection who understands the languages and issues of both sides. People who work at HQ headquarters versus local field office. Being able to position and being able to dissect in conversation between those. Um, all these kind of position points allow you to learn the languages of the different groups and to be able to integrate and negotiate better, um, which I think is, is useful. Um, So I'm, I'm going to give some, I guess, lessons of leadership, particularly managing a team during COVID-19, which is, it's not, it's not for the, the faint of heart. Um, one, I lead with kindness and compassion, and I always assume people have good intentions. So coming here, um, when I first got here, we weren't going into work at all. Um, and now we've moved to like 50% telework, but the, the thing that people don't realize about teleworking in this part of the world is that you, you often have electricity shortages or you often have internet outages. Um, having a laptop is a luxury. And so I had to learn all that about how, how does my team work at home? Like realistically, what can they produce? So assuming people have good intentions, understanding their needs and then adapting my leadership style to what their needs are. So I know that there's kind of like uh, advice to, to find, kind of figure out what your leadership style is. And I do, I, like, I, like, I'm very structured, um, economics major, number, I like numbers, I like Excel sheets, but I can't like be that person all the time. I have to really adapt to the strengths of my team and, and kind of how they prefer communication. So some prefer emails, some prefer WhatsApp, some prefer me to just go and, and talk to them one-on-one -on -one or have a phone call with them. So I have to adapt myself to how they receive um, information and instructions. Um, with that being said, um, I'm flexible. Um, I communicate my vision so they can understand why I'm telling them to do something. Mm -hmm. And then uh, being a middle manager, you really have to manage everyone's expectations. You have to manage your peers. You have to manage the people you're supervising. You especially have to manage your, the top leadership because they, they're like, oh, Christina, you're a high performer. Let's get all this done. I'm like, no, <laughs> my people are working at home 50% of the time and they might or may not have internet. So this is what we can realistically do. So um, yeah, those are, those are some of uh, the lessons I've gotten just from my few months um, at post now. That's wonderful. That's that's really helpful. And I just want to be mindful of the time. I think this is probably going to be our last question and then we can kind of do any parting thoughts. Maybe that's a good way to kind of wrap it up with a bow. Um, so we've gotten some questions about the foreign service and entry way into the foreign service. And so maybe if Morgan and Christina, if you could give what is the process to get into the foreign service for the, each of the respective organizations. Some people may have came late. I know that maybe you've touched on it a little bit when you talked about your journeys, but if you could re, re um, restate that for us. So Christina and then Morgan. So the, the process for the Foreign Service State Department, um, take the test, the Foreign Service Officer Test. Uh, if you look it up, um, there's instructions to register uh, careers.state.gov. It's almost free. They charge you a $5 deposit. And if you show up, they give it to you. They, get, they return it. So that's why I say it's almost free. So that's, I mean, that's like the lowest for me, the lowest uh, barrier. Um, it, it tests you on US history, economics, social studies. So I took it like straight out of college doing economics. So I am not the best person to give advice on how to study for the test because mm -hmm. I didn't study, but um, I just take the test. And even if you don't pass it, you know what's on it. So you can study for next time. Yeah, yeah that's a good point, Morgan. Uh, as I mentioned, USA doesn't actually have an exam. So we have sp more specialized positions and you just apply directly to the position or mm -hmm. positions that you're interested in um, on USA jobs. Um, the same thing goes for many of the other foreign affairs agencies that I mentioned like commerce or foreign agricultural service. They'll just have openings that you can apply to that specific position. And then in terms of the hiring process, uh, similar to the state process, there is some sort of oral assessment process where you have to do um, some group exercises, where you have to do some written exercises, really just to sort of see the whole candidate. Um, you may be asked to do a language test. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that is also included in a lot of the interview processes if you have proficiency in the language. 
Um, but the processes tend to be uh, more similar for those agencies that are not a uh, state. So there's no exam, just find the position that you're interested in. Um, we do have higher education requirements. So many of the USAID foreign service positions do require a master's degree or above. Um, that's not consistent across the board for all foreign service, but that's a unique feature that we have. So um, I would just say, identify the position you're interested in and apply. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and right now, so with, with, I think with both of our agencies, we are doing a hiring surge. And so there are some um, positions that are open and available right now. And they think that they close March 1st. So you have about a month um, and some change to apply for them. But um, with USA to this specifically, they do want people as Paul, or pardon me, as Stephen said, with, with technical experience. And so um, if, you know, the more experience that you have, I see someone said that they have a PhD and number of years of experience, you're highly competitive. You're highly competitive um, because at that point you you are a P, you know, you are an expert. Um, I worked in an office, I worked in democracy and governance, and we had multiple PhDs on our team advising, um, advising our policies and, and, and programs. So that's very common. Um, the other thing that we want to touch on is civil service. And so civil service, um, also those jobs are accessed and found at usajobs.com or .gov, what am I saying, .gov. Um, and so apply for those jobs, you know, really thoroughly read it. I'm actually doing a training on federal resume writing. So thoroughly read over the civil service positions. Make sure that you satisfy the qualifications. I want to repeat that. Make sure that you satisfy the qualifications because they have to hire based on the qualifications. It's a competitive process. And so the qualifications are, are non-negotiable. They're, they're, it's, not, it's not like the private sector where you can say, well, I haven't done this, but I've done the, the, the 10 things. I just haven't done one. You, you, you won't be considered. They, you have to meet the qualifications. So really thoroughly review those, review the questionnaire. So there's a, a vacancy questionnaire, review the questionnaire before you write your resume and write your resume to respond to the qualifications and to respond to the questionnaire. All right, that's my advice as a person who's literally gonna be teaching this on Tuesday. Um, so thank you all so much. Right now we're gonna do one final, I think we probably need to turn it over to Paul, I'm sorry. So thank you all so much for speaking. Thank you to our panelists, our my, my ICAP family. Consider ICAP, like I said, ICAP may be one of those programs that maybe you're not eligible to apply for right now, or maybe you kind of feel like I need to get some more years in my um, years of experience, but definitely keep an eye out for it and apply if you need to reapply reapply. It's a wonderful, um, what a wonderful association. And um, just to be a part of the, the network that um, are, are the are the fellows, it's amazing. It's been wonderful to see all the announcements of people getting great jobs. So, so definitely apply for it. Thank you so much. And we're going to hand it back over to Paul at this time.